Today we're gonna cover everything you should have in an electronics lab. Hi, I'm Daniel Bogdanoff, and welcome to the Keysight Labs channel, where we believe testing should be the easy part. Today I'm gonna to break down the essential things that every electronics lab should have. You can also follow along, score your lab, put your score in the comments, and see how set up you are compared to other people. You know, get some bragging rights. Look for an indicator like this and add that to your total score if you have that in your lab. Keep track on your calculator, which is something you should have in your lab. Two points. I've also put together a checklist and a scorecard. There's a link to that download in the description. I've watched a lot of the other Build-A-Bench videos and they missed some important things. And this one's a bit different from those. I have no affiliated links and there's no hidden agenda. It's a public agenda and I'm gonna be upfront with you about it and get a quick sponsor spot in. Plot twist, I'm the sponsor. We just released the Smart Bench Essentials, the essential four instruments found on practically every electronics bench, a DMM, power supply, function generator, and an oscilloscope, with new control software that makes controlling and remotely accessing your setup really easy. I'm not gonna go too much deeper into these now, but I'm giving away over 100 pieces of test equipment, including these, as part of Keysight University Live. Go sign up now using the link in the description and to get access to a ton of other things going on as part of this event. We'll start with safety first, because safety third, first, safety thirds. A fire extinguisher. Everyone using the lab should know where this is. I don't see many other videos recommend this, but you should absolutely have one in your lab. I think we can spray it in here. Maybe outside, I've actually never sprayed one. Let's go outside. Also get a first aid kit. I've cut myself on more sheet metal than I'd like to admit. To avoid having to use your first aid kit and losing your eyesight, get good protective glasses. No, good protective glasses. Good actual rated ones. And finally, a voltage detection tool that tells you if there's a no touchy situation. My DMM actually has one built in. Shameless plug. Other than human safety, you should also protect your devices. Grounded ESD mats and a wrist or ankle strap are super important. You can actually damage your devices without feeling it. It doesn't have to arc from your finger. Don't get lazy with any of these. I used the calculator watch turned ESD strap that I built in a previous video. We also turned a Rolex into an ESD strap. Now that we're safe, we can start building stuff. And by stuff, I mean electronics, so we'll need a soldering station. That's of course, ideally, a temperature-controlled soldering iron. If you're gonna cheap out, at least get a temperature-controlled one. And bonus points for hot air and hot plate tools. To actually use all that, you should have solder flux and solder and solder remover thingies. That's the technical term. Pro tip for your iron, a lot of people like to go with a chisel tip and about 0.3 millimeter-ish rosin core solder, unless you have a good reason not to. I also like to have a junk tip that I can use for things that soldering irons shouldn't really be doing, like melting plastic that's in the way or working out your company's branding. <laughs> Having a junky one means you don't have to ruin your good ones. For flux, I like flux pens. Some people go full paste with it. Plus two points if you have all this. If electronics isn't already your vice, you'll need some sort of vice or clamp to hold the things you're soldering and tweezers so you don't have to place components barehanded. Never doing that again. Get a set of cheap black market tweezers so you can lose some like I did or splurge on ceramic ones so you don't scratch or zap things. It's a big internet debate, much like magnification, so you can all fight it out amongst yourselves in the comments. Much like water, solder smoke is pretty, but you shouldn't breathe it because you know, cancer. So use a fume extractor. Listen up, real talk time. I put a poll up on Twitter to see who uses a fume extractor. Almost 600 of you answered and 74% of you said you don't use one. Instead of publicly shaming the 441 of you like I feel like I should do, I'm just gonna positively reinforce the 154 of you that do use one. Way to be, you'll outlive us all. Super real talk time, mine's been in a box for four months and I just pulled it out for this video. I'm sorry, I promise I'll be better. Once your boards are together, it will always work right the first time, but doing a bit of debugging and performance characterization never hurts, which means it's test gear time. <laughs> to supply power to your device, you'll need a power supply. I often find that people don't need quite as much wattage as they think, but it is nice to overspec a bit. However, as you go higher in power output, you lose resolution, so max power is not the only spec you should care about. I prefer to have a triple output power supply for the flexibility in voltage and current outputs. And with these, you can also combine channels and double up on the voltage or current. It also lets you set over voltage and over current protection so you don't fry your device with a short. It has built-in data logging so you don't have to break out Excel and it can coordinate on and off timings of the different channels. 
If you're doing USB powered devices, I really like this design from Lewis Lab. You can bring up your device through a USB cable without accidentally zapping a computer or running through a wall outlet. Plus three points if you have a benchtop power supply and plus two additional points if you have at least three outputs. I also like to have some of these cheap boost and butt converters on hand. They're cheap enough and small enough to go into a one-off project or prototype and come in handy when you need a quick and dirty voltage rail. Power supplies are one of those things that last forever, but you could always use one more. That's also true of multimeters. The next thing you need in your lab is a DMM. Well, DMMs, plural, or multi-multimeters. One is okay, two is good, but three is best. Why three? One for each hand. Actually, if you only have one, you have to assume your reading is correct. And DMMs are all about the fine details, the resolution. So if you have two, you can use them to verify each other's measurements. But what if they have different readings? Which one is correct? That's where the third one comes in, and suddenly we have a DMM democracy. Having two also allows you to measure voltage and current at the same time, which is nice for power calculations. I'm spoiled, I know, but I like to have a benchtop DMM, a nice handheld DMM, and a not as nice handheld DMM that has auto ranging. The cheaper one can break without breaking my heart, and then I have a nice portable option and a benchtop option. Which leads us to a bonus segment, benchtop DMMs versus handheld DMMs. It's like a little video within a video. Having a benchtop DMM is nice because you get some extra bells and whistles. A benchtop DMM like these typically have better precision and accuracy, faster reading speeds, often a hundred or a thousand times faster than these, more readings per second, and it has wider measurement ranges. It'll play nicer in test automation systems and has a much better display and analysis capability. You can also make four wire measurements. A handheld DMM is nice because it's super rugged, it's okay, it was made for that. And now we'll try it with the benchtop version. No, I'm just kidding, we won't do that. <laughs> handhelds are typically safer to use with high voltages. You'll see cat three or cat four on a handheld versus typically cat two on a benchtop. This is isolated from power line noise, which occasionally can mess up a benchtop DMM in some situations. And the handhelds sometimes have special troubleshooting features like a built-in flashlight, Bluetooth connectivity, a square wave generator, a contactless voltage sensor, or a harmonic ratio measurement function. This new Benchtop DMM has a seven inch color display, nice PC-based control software and data locking. It can also make secondary measurements like DC and AC at the same time, or maybe measure a temperature sensor so you can correlate the main measurement and the temperature at which that measurement was made. So you can see why I like to have both, plus three points to your lab score if you have a Benchtop DMM, plus two points for a handheld DMM, and plus one bonus point if you have two or more handheld DMMs. Maybe your device needs a little help as you test it, like it needs a clock signal, or you really wanna put it through its paces and stress test it. That's where the trusty function generator comes in. It's called a function generator because it can create signals based on mathematical functions. That's a snooze fest to dig into, so instead, look at all these pretty signals it can create. Ooh. You can pick up a cheapo analog function generator kit like this for less than 10 bucks, but if you really want any sort of flexibility in your test, go with something like these. This one and its bigger siblings here can modulate signals, sweep frequencies, and create bursts if your testing requires it. You can also create your own arbitrary waveform. Well, it's arbitrary in that it can be whatever signal you want, not that you can just use any signal willy-nilly in your testing. Since this has two channels, you can also couple their amplitude and frequencies for testing things like a differential amplifier. The main factors for a function generator are its feature set, like what snazzy things it can do, and the purity of its signals, which is typically talked about jitter and total harmonic distortion. Jitter is more or less how much the signals wiggle, and total harmonic distortion is more or less how much power there is outside of the specific frequency of a given sine wave. You can do a lot from the front panel of these, but they really shine when you build ARBs and custom patterns on a PC and port them over to the box. Plus three points to your lab score if you have a function generator and two bonus points if it has modulation or frequency sweep capabilities. The last core tool that you gotta have on any serious test bench is an oscilloscope. An oscilloscope shows you what a signal looks like. It's like a camera for electricity and that's why we used it to look at the function generator signals. I could literally spend hours digging into the nuance and minutia of oscilloscopes, but in the interest of time, I'll just say that you need one on your bench. That's it.
No, I'm just kidding, I can't stop there. What I've seen in the majority of standard electronics labs around the world is oscilloscopes with four channels or inputs with a couple few hundred megahertz of bandwidth, which is basically how fast of a signal you can see. I do not recommend starting with an analog oscilloscope. They're huge, they're heavy, and they're really annoying to use. There are also some okay USB-based scopes out there, but there's just no substitute for a modern digital oscilloscope, and they really aren't that spendy unless you wanna get fancy with it. They can decode serial buses and help you figure out that everything was fine, but you connected your TX to your TX and your RX to your RX, been there, and help you spot any weirdness on your device that might be causing unreliability or intermittent failures. The fancy term is make parametric measurements. This bad boy also has a digital voltmeter, frequency counter, and a 20 megahertz function generator with ARB built right in. It's pretty handy. Plus eight points if you have a benchtop scope, and if you only have a non-benchtop scope, I feel like I should give you some points, so two points. I don't know if this is true for you, but I've found that a lot of my hand tools have slowly moved from my garage at home into my lab area here at work. So here are some more traditional tools that feel right at home in an electronics lab. First up is drivers. Not software drivers, but I guess hardware drivers? Screwdrivers, hex drivers, and especially Torx drivers. A little PC repair kit is a nice option. You never know what sort of hardware you'll be working with. Files are good for getting the little spikes off your boards or the sharp parts off of casings. And of course, needle nose pliers, wire strippers, and wire cutters. Mm -hmm. Nubs, can I say nub? For wire cutters, it's nice to have side cutters, which cut flush to get rid of extra leads or wires. And this is another situation where I prefer to have a nice pair for nice things and a bad pair for bad things. A hot glue gun is also a clutch tool. It's great for impromptu strain relief or accidentally burning your fingertips. That reminds me I need to restock the burn cream in my first aid kit. A hobby knife is great for chopping traces when you have to bodge something together or apart, or if you wanna be dollar store Wolverine. Calipers, they measure stuff. No need to get too fancy. If you're bodging, it's also nice to have some grab bags of components and spares of your commonly used parts. I like to keep my SMD packages the same size, so if I need to swap out a part value, it's super easy. Trimmer potentiometers are also a clutch component to have around if you need to, say, fine tune an amplifier. Having some spare leads, banana plugs, alligator plugs, whatever those grabber thingies are called, and oscilloscope probes are useful too. Give yourself up to five points based on how set up you think you are. No cheating. A rotary tool also comes in handy if you planned poorly like I'm prone to do and need to go the nuclear route with your board. And of course, a rubbish bin. Not a little like washroom one, get a bigger one like a bucket, which will probably still overflow. Get a big one, which is definitely still gonna overflow. You'll thank me later. I'm not sure why I went British with those terms. And for cleaning up a can of compressed air, which doubles as freezer spray when inverted. It's like a rocket ship. <laughs> right into the microphone. And of course, it never hurts to add a little personal flair. And that, my friends, is a stocked lab. I'd love to see your scores in the comments, scores of scores, as well as anything you can't live without in your lab because I certainly missed some things. Keysight University Live is happening right now and these are our first winners. They get their pick of one of these new SmartBench Essentials products. Congratulations. The rest of today's winners will be announced in the live stream on the Keysight University Live webpage. The link is below if you aren't already watching it on that page. We also have a fascinating interview with one of the lead engineers for this gear and you can access everything on demand if you're too late for the live stream. Check it out now, the link is below and I'll see you over there.